Welcome to Back to My Garden. Discover your passion for gardening. Here's Dave Ledoux. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. When you listen to this, I'm Dave Ledoux, and welcome to another episode of Back to My Garden. Amazing guest for you today, folks. Marcy loves herbs. The intoxicating fragrance of herbs often distracts her from the weeding in her garden. She is a contributing author to Essential Herbal Magazine's new book, Through the Seasons, and Marcy blogs at www.backyardpatch.com. Her online store markets her proprietary blends of teas, bath products, and dried herbs, or herbs, sorry. (laughs) We're going to talk about how to pronounce that today as well. We have a lot to discuss. Please welcome from Illinois, Marcy Latanen raleigh Well, thank you very much, David. How am I doing so far? Not bad at all. Now, I know you've got a foot of snow on the ground, as do I. Um, I've given you a brief introduction. Uh, Marcy, sit back, relax, take a minute or two. Tell us a little bit about your background and how did you get into gardening? Well, it was actually my grandmother who um, took me plant shopping when I was about 10 and uh, and decided that I needed to put in a garden plot at my parents' house. And uh, she introduced me to some real traditional flowers like um, bleeding heart and columbine and um, plants like that. And it wasn't until I had gotten married and moved to Illinois that I got into herbs. A friend of mine from college dragged me to a lecture by a woman named Jan Butler, who had a shop in Geneva, Illinois. And uh, it was wintertime, about now, where, again, we had, you know, a couple feet of snow on the ground. And and, um, she introduced me to what you could do with an herb garden, and then I had all winter to plan one. And I put a garden outside the uh, back door of my house. It was about six feet by five feet. A nice little kitchen garden for a family of two. And uh, by the time we moved out of that house uh, 10 years later, the garden was 22 feet by 17 feet. And I had three other gardens on the property. Yeah. (laughs) See, gardens can multiply, can't they? (laughs) They do. They breed like rabbits. Marcy and I are going to sit back and talk about herbs for 20 minutes. If you're listening to us driving in your car, I'll take all the notes for you. I'll have all the links and resources up on the blog at backtomygarden.com. Marcy has, well, first of all, follow her on social media, uh, on Twitter, at Backyard Patch. I almost called it a blog, but it's a blog, it's a store, uh, it's a dot .com uh, uh, business. It's www.backyardpatch.com. Can we start with your store? Because I went to it today. It's very exciting. Uh, how long have you been a dot-com entrepreneur? I actually started my first backyardpatch.com back in 1996. Um, <laughs> the World Wide Web. It was relatively new then, yeah. 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 <laughs> wow. It was but primitive back then. Who- yeah, I had a friend who was um, who had his own server, and so he helped me put together the website and take pictures and all the stuff I'd never done with my herbs before, and so that was kind of fun. Now, Marcy, we have listeners, I think like 62 countries. Do you ship only in the Amer- uh, United States or all over? Un- unfortunately, because they are herbs, I can only ship to the United States and Canada. Okay. Well, that makes sense. You have to have you know, special stuff. So I only, I only ship overseas my photographs and my garden journals and my um, cards and things like that. Oh, nice. Okay, so listeners, if you're out of the North America, definitely check out the site because there's something for everybody. Uh, you've been doing this now in internet years forever, like 20 years. Congratulations. Thanks. What was 2014 like for you as a gardener? Um, it was a good year, gardening-wise. It was odd. We had an incredibly snowy winter in 2013. And so when we got to the garden season, um, everything was well. The soil was, was nice and wet, and, and everything was, you know, well-protected, and a, not a lot of winter kill because it was covered with a blanket of snow all winter, which is wonderful. 
but it was cold in the spring. And so it looked like a year I was going to get cuttings from my herbs early, like in April. Then the weather turned cold and stayed that way well into June. And so I didn't get my first harvest until um, Memorial Day weekend, which was very disappointing. But then once it got warm, then the herbs went crazy. It was a really good year for herbs, not so great for vegetables. So you had that polar vortex that never seemed to go away. Yeah, pretty much. It got really cold, and I I was really panicked when they started talking about how cold the weather was going to get because um, when it gets that cold and it's windy here by the lake, um, it can really decimate the herbs because it just dries them out, that raking wind. Um, But then we ended up having a snowstorm in December that lasted until sometime in March on the ground. We never saw grass until March. I guess some herbs love hot weather, and then some can handle kind of shady, cool, gray, rainy weather. Yeah, um, what was interesting in my garden this year was that um, the ones that like the moisture, like the ones that use a lot of moisture, basil, uh, mint, Um, any of those, they did exceptionally well because we had a significant amount of rain and the soil was wet from the snow. And so they just, I mean, you had to literally take a machete to them because they were growing so fast. And, uh, and the ones that preferred the cooler weather like tarragon, uh, did very well, uh, this past year. Illinois can get very warm in the summertime and very sunny and tarragon really doesn't like that. And so normally I have to, I have probably the month of July and August where the tarragon gets a little straggly and you cut it back and throw it away and use it for compost because you can't harvest the leaves for flavor. And this year that wasn't the case. So I was kind of excited. I haven't had as good a tarragon harvest as I had um, in 2014. You said something that uh, I have to ask you about. Uh, In our house, mint is a four-letter word. Do you have any strategies so it doesn't take over your entire garden? There's two strategies that I have used for uh, gardening with mint. One is to plant it in competition with other things. I had a couple of trees, um, a Kentucky coffee tree and an apple tree, both of which suck a lot of water out of the ground. And I planted the mint around those. And it keeps them from spreading and taking over because they have to spend a bit more time just trying to exist. Now, if you don't have that ability, um, then I always recommend planting it in a container. Um, I used to save pickle buckets uh, from the deli down the street and cut the bottoms off of them and bury them in the ground and then put one mint plant in each bucket. And then the rule was, if anything took a runner outside of the bucket and was rooted on the outside of the rim of the bucket, then it was sacrificed, dug up, planted somewhere else, given to a friend, or otherwise composted, so that the the um, knit plants stayed put, so to speak. Okay, so it's not just me. It is. It's very insidious, insidious stuff. <laughs> Given ideal conditions, they will pretty much take over the place. You must have an incredibly good smelling compost at your at your garden. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, I, I, um, I'm a lazy composter. I don't um, do a lot of uh, turning of the compost pile. If I turn it twice in one year, that's a good year. Um, and so I use a three-bin method where I have one bin that's all green, you know, new stuff I'm tossing in. And then I have a second bin that was the one that I tossed stuff into last year, which I will turn in the spring and bring all of the the soil from the bottom that just kind of occurs up to the top. And then there's the third bin that was from two years ago, and that one's actually soil now, and I start putting that on the garden. And so um, I think as a result of having three bins and lots of herbs in it, my neighbors have never complained. Wonderful. I love composting secrets because... When you start getting into it, you realize how much waste there is in the average family. Oh, it's amazing. And um, I like to, my husband likes to uh, eggs. And so I save all the eggshells and I use them uh, 
as uh, in my container plants to um, help with the pH, but also to create grit in the soil. Um, and uh, and he he, he uh, does his coffee by drip, so I can save the coffee grounds and use those in my container plants, which keeps my herbs very happy in the winter time. Love it. Uh, we have a lot of listeners who are city gardeners, like little patio gardens and skyscrapers. Do you have any advice for somebody brand new who says, I want to grow a herb next year? Where's a good spot for the absolute rookie to start? Well, the herbs are the greatest thing to grow if you want to start gardening on a patio and can actually use it in some way. Because, I mean, herbs are weeds. They don't call it herbicide for nothing. And so, as a result, um, herbs are relatively simple. They don't require anything special. They like a good, well-drained soil, but if you put... Um, a mixture of potting soil, peat moss, and compost together and lay it over pebble bricks or broken pots in the bottom of the container um, so that it gets good drainage, you can pretty much grow any herb. I would say the er easiest herb to start with would be basil. Um, It's got its own barometer. If you forget to water it, it wilts. And if you water it once it wilts, it perks back up. Um, Unlike some herbs where if you don't water them, they go, oh, thank you, I'm leaving now. And they die. Um, basil's a little bit more resilient. If you like something that is more scented rather than culinary, although you can't eat these, I recommend scented geranium. They're another one. They like a sandier soil, and as a result, you don't have to water them as frequently because a lot of times herbs on the patio, they have to be watered every day if you have a lot of sunshine because the soil just dries out. Um, but these actually like to dry out between watering, so they're a little bit more resilient if you have a busy lifestyle. And the, the foliage is so incredibly scented that you can pretty much choose a scent you like. So if you like chocolate or mint or rose or lemon, I happen to like rose and lemon, and there's probably 30 different varieties of rose and lemon and rose and lemon combined, uh, scented geraniums. They don't have a showy flower, but the foliage is amazingly um, scented, and when you bump into it, it gives off the scent. I used to um, arrange them on the stairs by our front door so that every time you walked out of the house, you bumped into them, and it would release the scent. Um, and they're just awesome, and they're a really easy plant to grow. Fantastic. I wanted to ask you about backyardpatch.com. You started it in 1996, growing and marketing your herbs. Were you ever, like, nervous in the beginning of starting that? Uh, Did you have a big plan to be an entrepreneur, or did it just happen? You know, I had two friends who were both into herb gardening, and we all went to that lecture together. And one of them was into making wreaths and decorative items with herbs, and the other one was into potpourri and... um, and bath things, and I was more into the culinary and tea uses of herbs. And so we said we should go into business together. And I said, well, that sounds like a great idea. And so I took the ball and ran with it, and they forgot to follow me. And as a result, I ended up with all these, you know, ideas and products, and I packaged them up and sent them to my family for Christmas. And come February, they were calling me on the phone saying, you know that thing you gave me for Christmas? Um, I would really like to give that to somebody else as a gift, and I'll pay you for it. And I'm thinking, well, if my family would pay me for this, then real people would too. Yeah, <laughs> real people, yeah. <laughs> and that was kind of how it happened. It was kind of an accident. So 19, almost 20 years later, you must have a real good feel for what your customers love and uh, can you share maybe a little bit about what brings you the most pleasure in Backyard Patch? Well, I actually started growing herbs because I really like herbal tea. And at the time, back in the late 80s, early 90s, the only herbal tea you could buy was chamomile or peppermint. And that's what went for herbal tea. And I believe that herbal tea is more a combination of flavors and the nuances of the flavors of the herbs. And so I started to grow the herbs with the intent to blend teas and, and sell those. And, of course, um, nobody knew what herbal tea was. Nobody wanted to experiment with herbal tea. Nobody wanted to drink herbal tea. And so, <laughs> so I was kind of like, 
floundering around going, nobody wants my stuff. And, um, and so I focused more on the culinary herbs and found that even if you sold every culinary herb in really good quality, that people still didn't know what to do with it. Um, they hadn't had an experience with, with using it, and so that made me create things that people could just use. And so I blended the herbs together, so instead of, you know, here's the three herbs you can use on poultry, I put them together and created a poultry seasoning. And I created a meat seasoning, and then I created dips and salad dressings and meat rubs and things like that. What I find now is that you go through um, stages. In the late 90s, um, healthy eating and herbs became incredibly popular. People wanted to cook with herbs. People wanted to try herbal teas. And so my business really picked up. And then in the 2000s, um, a lot of the other more commercial companies picked up on the idea that people liked herbs, and my business fell back a little bit. And now it's coming back again, and this time... It's, um, there's two things that are really popular. Grilling, using herbs in grilling and grilling outside and outdoor cooking. And then the herb teas are in everybody's purview again. And I'm so excited about that because that was what I wanted to do in the first place. And now I get people calling me up and saying, can you make me a blend with this herb in it? Because I really would like to, I heard it was good for me and I'd really like to try it, but everything I've tried is nasty tasting. I believe it doesn't matter how good it is for you. If you don't like it, you're not going to take it. Spectacular. I love how you uh, gave them the definition. Here, this is for pork. Here, this is for, you know, a meat rub. And so they go from having a huge question mark and you literally tell them what to do with it. Yeah, and I, I love to cook with herbs. So it's like I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of recipes and I just, you know, I was like, i got to share these somehow. Um, and so I would give away recipes at the farmer's markets and, and, and the lecturing events and things like that. And then that's what forced me to start the blog so that I could share as many recipes as I possibly could and, you know, find the seasonal ones. Okay, now it's hot weather. Let's make some lemonade with herbs. And, and now it's, it's grilling season. Let's try this meat rub. And now it's wintertime. Let's make this soup. Um, and so I can really delve into all those experiments with herbs that uh, that I've done for all these years. I love it. At my house, we do a lot of uh, canning and a lot of cooking with tomatoes and hot peppers. So cilantro is like it's going out of style, as much as we can grow. But now in January, you go to the store and there's these five sad little wilted cilantros for $3. And they, I haven't quite figured out a strategy. We've got some cilantro planted under our grow lights in our basement. I have found that cilantro grown inside lacks a lot of flavor, and I haven't mastered what they need in, to make up for the outdoors that they seem to like so much. But cilantro is a picky plant, too, because if it gets too hot, it bolts. Mm -hmm. Here oh. in Illinois, they have a slow bolt variety that you can get that I have had some good success with. Um, but still, I end up sowing a crop every two weeks so that I have a constant crop of cilantro in case it gets hot. That's kind of one of my jobs in the garden. My wife assigns me to pick those seed pods when they go to seed and collect them and grind them up. And that's kind of our winter version of cilantro. Like I'm crazy for herbs. I mean, every time we're out in the garden weeding, my wife will grab a leaf and squish it and then say, smell this. And that's kind of the game. Like I had no idea what lemon verbena was until recently. Oh, lemon verbena is, without a doubt, the most wonderful lemon herb in the universe. It, uh, it's, it's actually a deciduous tree it's native to Central America. I, when I went to Guatemala, um, I went to a nature preserve and saw it in its native habitat for the first time, and it was eight feet tall these branches overhanging this thing and you could just walk along and stroke the branches with your fingers and release that lemon scent and it was the most wonderful experience in my life unbelievable eight feet tall <laughs> i'm doing something wrong in my garden mine's not that tall <laughs> i just glanced at the clock marcy our time is whipping by and now is the time in the show where we play a game 
called Five Quick Questions. Okay. This is your chance to share your wisdom and experience with novice gardeners. Are you ready to play? All right. All right. Question number one. What is the funniest or craziest mistake that you've ever made in your garden that you're willing to admit to in public? <laughs> I put wood round as the... Uh, pass in my garden thinking it would be, you know, rustic and it would be great and it would be, you know, good for the environment. And the earwigs loved living underneath those wood rounds and would come out every night and eat every plant, taking all of the leaves off of it. <gasps> I hate earwigs. <sighs> <laughs> and I figured out that's where they were living and I had to get rid of the wood rounds and replace them with, with stone. Yeah, dark and moist and... Uh... If you can interrupt their breeding cycle, you can kind of get ahead of them, but they're horrible. Yeah. Once count. they get set in, they're, they're hard to get rid of. Question number two. If you were only allowed to grow one plant next year, what plant would you have to grow? I would have to grow lemon thyme. I like thyme. But lemon thyme with its lemon overtone and yet its rich, savory thymeness underneath, you can cook everywhere with it. It makes a great tea. Thyme is an antifungal, antibacterial, so you can make cleaning products with it. So if I only had one herb, that would be my versatility herb to go to. Whoa, great. I'm trying to write all that down. Versatility. I like that. I didn't know about the uh, cleaning products. That's unique. And, and you have some of those on your... No, you're more into the bath products on your store. Do you have any cleaning Very products good. on your uh, yeah, store? Yeah, actually, that's something new I have started doing because of the the people who don't have the the time to make them themselves. And uh, so I make a dish soap, you know, for the dishwasher, and I make uh, sc- uh, like a a scouring powder, soft scrub kind of a thing, and uh, and then I make um, disinfecting herbal vinegars. That's awesome. I mean, so many kids, especially, have allergies and they're sensitive to chemicals. Yeah, I mean, I I started using herbs in the house because my husband has a sensitivity to chemicals and preservatives. And um, and it's funny because I never thought to sell a lot of the things I used in my own house. Fantastic. Uh, Question three. Um, Websites. Do you have one or two favorite gardening resource website or herb uh, resource websites that you could share? I have um, in Chicago a guy named Mike Nowak, and his website is mikenowak.net, and that's N-O-W-A-K, and he does everything about gardening and interviews people much like you do, um, And but he focuses in on what happens here in this part of the Midwest, and I find that a lot of the gardening books focus on... Um, zone six through nine which is great but here in the midwest we're in zone four and five and so what you know lemongrass is awesome but it doesn't winter over here and i get tired of reading books that say you know cover it with mulch and it'll come back next year no it won't (laughs) i understand completely (laughs) where i live in october it's always a fight to try to find the last straw bale to Save your strawberries. <laughs> yeah, we around here we uh, we listen to uh, Tom Skilling, and when he says it's going to go below forty, then it's get on the the miner's helmet and go harvest the basil before it turns black. Nice. So Mike dot net. I'll have a link up on the site for that for sure. Good. Uh, and then of course there'll be links to backyardpatch.com. dot com. Make sure you listeners you bookmark that. Uh, number four. Uh, gardening books. Do you have a favorite gardening book that you can recommend? I. It's a simple book. It's relatively thin. It's called Growing Herbs from Seed Cutting and Root by Tom DiBaggio. Tom DiBaggio died just a few years ago um, after a heroic fight with Alzheimer's. And um, one of the things many of us used to say as he was coming to Alzheimer's was he has forgotten more about herbs than most of us will ever know in our lifetime. He was amazing with his knowledge of herbs. And this particular book, which is not very demanding in terms of space and size, gives you everything you ever needed to know to propagate any herb. 
whether from seed or from cutting or from root division. And he talks about soil preparation and how to do it and, and, and what to do if it fails and the diseases and every little aspect. And he talks from experience, which makes you less afraid to try what he suggests. I love it. I love those classics by the, the masters, you know, the absolute pinnacle of a craft. So I'll have a link up for that one. Uh, question five is a fun one, Marcy. No right or wrong answer. Just kind of, uh, is there anything that you've never grown that you would love to experiment with? I have never grown. Hmm. I tend to stay away from uh, a lot of vegetables. And so I've grown tomatoes and all of the herbs that go with making, you know, salsa and things. But I've never been one to grow melons or eggplant or anything like that. And I think that I would really like to try and see what those vegetables are like and whether or not they're as easy to grow or, or more difficult to grow or even using a different skill set than I've used growing herbs. I bet you they translate. I, I would have to find the perfect vegetable that would be like a, a gateway drug for you, like a, a garlic or something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've grown garlic and I've grown tomatoes and I've, I've grown corn. But those are all those are all pretty close to growing herbs. Um, whereas you know the viney things and the melons and the squashes and things like that, I've never really tried them, and I think that they might be a significant departure for me. I'm hooked on this slippery slope of crazy hot pepper. Like those, uh, they're almost like a novelty hot pepper because there are a million plus Scoville units. Oh wow. Yeah, and it started with one little plant, and it was just so powerful that I, I have a, a level of respect. Like you have to wear gloves to harvest them, you got to wear go goggles to clean them and cook them. <laughs> That's like harvesting horseradish, almost. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Do you know anyone that's ever killed successfully a horseradish? Like they're impossible to get rid of once they're in your garden. Well, and once if you are in that zone, which is the middle of the of the of North America, um, you pretty much can't kill them because you're in the zone where they prosper. You know, I have friends who live in Florida who's never grown a horseradish in their life because they can't grow there. Ah, yeah. As a kid, my soil was sandy. We're up. Uh north of Minneapolis, uh, near Winnipeg, and the root went down six feet deep. Oh, yeah. We eventually yeah, built a sh problem. Yeah, that it goes so deep, you'll never kill it. Yeah, if you, if, you, if, if you succeed in getting most of it, you'll leave just enough behind to grow a new plant next year. That's what happened. <laughs> Three years later, it poked its head out, and we were going to build a shed on it just to kill it, but I had a vision of a Jack and the Beanstalk on this giant horseradish. <laughs> do you now you've been doing this 20 years do you have anything that refuses to grow in your garden i have killed a fair number of lavender plants and it took me a while to figure out it has a couple of nuances that um that i wasn't fully aware of because lavender doesn't like the raking wind so it's got to be heavily mulched um, you need to trim it back in the fall, but not too far back in the fall. I did that a couple times and killed it. Um, it um, it doesn't like wet feet, so if it rains too much, then it gets moldy in the root and dies, and you have to pull it out, otherwise the mold spreads to the other plants. Um, so I would say that that would probably be my challenging plant. Wow. You could Google all day and not find those tips. <laughs> I'm glad we snuck that in there. Four tips to grow gorgeous lavender. There's an ebook on Amazon right there. There you go. I'm the I'm the king of wet feet. I overwater everything. My wife, she says, "Give me that," and she just takes the hose, and I'm confiscated because I'm of the "if some is good, more is better" category, and still learning. Yeah, herbs really, you know, the Mediterranean, it's a little dry, so herbs like it a little dry. So my habit of forgetting to water or being too lazy to carry the hose uh, works out well for me. 
Well, there you go, dear listeners. I took half a page of notes. I'll have them up at backtomygarden.com. Follow Marcy on Twitter. Uh, she has an active Twitter stream at Backyard Patch. And by all means, go to her uh, blog and online store at www.backyardpatch.com. When you're looking for good gifts for gardeners, there's some tremendous items up there that'll get your imagination going. Uh, Marcy, the time has flown by. You've been an incredible guest. Well, thank you very much. I had a wonderful time. This was great. You know, we have a lot of listeners that uh, have never grown herbs before, and I'm sure they're going to give it a try this season. I want to give you the last word to the listeners today. Can you leave us with a pearl of wisdom or a note of inspiration? Well, the key with gardening, especially with herbs, is to write down everything that you like didn't like and what worked and didn't work because a year from now you will forget all of that in your flurry to replant your garden and if you just can look back at what you wrote down your gardening will always improve wow why herb gardeners must keep accurate records i love it tremendous stuff marcy thanks for being on the show all right thank you